Ezra chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, the word of the Lord is as follows. During the first year of King Cyrus of Persia's reign in 539 B.C., the Eternal One, or the Lord, influenced the spirit of the Persian king to send a proclamation and written letter throughout his empire, fulfilling the Lord's earlier message through the prophet Jeremiah. Cyrus proclaimed the Lord, the God of heaven, has decided to give me all the kingdoms of the world to rule as my own. In return for this, he has told me to build him a new house in Jerusalem of Judah. Any of his people living in my empire may return to Jerusalem of Judah with the help of the Lord God. There you may rebuild the temple of the Lord Israel's God with my resources and blessing because he is the God who lives in Jerusalem. Every Jew who lives here or in any other part of my empire and wishes to return to Jerusalem should be supported by his neighbors. They should give him silver, gold, goods, and cattle for his journey and should send a free will offering to God's temple in Jerusalem. The tribal leaders of Judah and Benjamin, the priests and Levites, and everyone motivated in his or her spirit by God, prepare to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the Lord's temple. All their neighbors gave them silver, gold, goods, cattle, and valuable things for the journey, just as Cyrus had requested and sent free will offerings. Even King Cyrus commanded his treasurer Mithradath to return the vessels from the Lord's temple, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and stored in his God's temple to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Thus far, the word of the Lord, you may be seated. During the first year of King Cyrus of Persia's reign in Babylon in 539 B.C., the Lord influenced the spirit of the Persian king to send a proclamation and written letter throughout his empire, fulfilling the Lord's earlier message through the prophet Jeremiah. Cyrus proclaimed, The Lord, the God of heaven, has decided to give me all the kingdoms of the world to rule as my own. In return for this, he has told me to build him a new house in Jerusalem of Judah. Any of his people living in my empire may return to Jerusalem of Judah with the help of the Lord God. There you may rebuild the temple of the Lord Israel's God with my resources and blessing. I want to preach today from the subject, the mindset of a vision carrier. Look at your neighbor and say, are you a carrier? Mm, Yeah, yeah mindset of a vision carrier. With our focus today being that of faith forward in action, we are accentuating our individual and collective calling to be vision carriers. Having accepted a mandate from God based upon what God has seen for us and desires to do through us, We enter the realm of carrying the vision. Individually and collectively, we took up the task of carrying the embracing the future, the expansion of ministry, the equipping of people, 
the empowering of communities, the evangelizing the world, the establishing a witness for God, and the extension of a legacy. This carrying of vision is not without its challenges, and we have faced and overcome many of them. Two of the more prevalent challenges that anyone will face in the course of carrying any vision is that of the length of time that you may have to carry it and the amount of sacrifice that is required from you in the carrying of the vision. And when any, either of those two challenges come, or if both of them come your way, it's in that time that you come to realize that not everybody is cut out to be a vision carrier. There are some who are vision watchers. That is to say, they stand on the sidelines or sit in the pews and just watch vision happening. There are vision critics who seek to poke holes in vision. There are vision consumers. That is, they consume the fruit of the vision without contributing to the manifestation of the vision. They'll get all the praise, get in all the word, take in all the studies, take in all everything that the church has to have without contributing to the manifestation of the vision. And then there are vision killers uh, who, who seek to pour cold water in the vision. But God's desire for God's people concerning God's vision is that God's people will carry and participate in the manifestation of the vision. God having revealed his vision for Israel's liberation from Egyptian bondage, God called Moses to carry and participate in the vision fulfillment. God having revealed his vision for the people possessing the land of promise, he called Joshua and Israel to carry and participate in the fulfillment of the vision. God, having revealed his vision for the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, God called Nehemiah and the people to carry and participate in the vision fulfillment. God, having revealed his vision for Gentile evangelization, God called Saul and Barnabas to carry and participate in vision fulfillment. And if one is to carry a vision, if one is to be a vision carrier, one has to have a certain mindset. There has to be a certain consciousness and perspective that a vision carrier has. The giving of yourself, of your time, of your talent, of your treasure comes out of an understanding that you have which will overcome the obstacles and the objections and the opposition. And uh, our text today shows us the mindset of a vision carrier. By all accounts, Cyrus of Persia would not be expected to be a vision carrier. If you just looked at his resume, you would not expect him to be a carrier of God's vision for God's people. And the primary reason why you would not expect him to be a vision carrier for God's people is that he was not one of God's people. He was not a Jew. He was not under the Abrahamic covenant. He was not bound by the Mosaic law. He was not raised up in the church. At the age of 13, he didn't have a bar mitzvah 
which signaled his being a son of the covenant and made him responsible for and accountable to the people of God. There is nothing about his background, nothing about his pedigree that would ever suggest that Cyrus would ever be caught up in a vision for God and God's people. He wouldn't have been on your short list of prospects in order to seed into the vision of God. And while there is nothing about his background, nothing about his past, nothing about his pedigree that would signal him as a potential vision carrier, verse 1 gives us these words. During the first year, of Cyrus, king of Persia's reign in 539 B.C., the Lord influenced the spirit of the Persian king to send a proclamation and a written letter throughout his empire, listen, fulfilling the Lord's earlier message through the prophet Jeremiah. You should know that Cyrus began his reign as king of Persia in 550 B.C. And he reigned as king of Persia from 550 B.C. to 530 B.C. You see, the closer that you get to the birth of Christ, the, sh the, the shorter the years become. It goes back in terms of time, 550 to 530. 20 years after he began his rule and as king of Persia, he leads a conquest of Babylon. And during that time of being king over Babylon, he becomes open to the voice of Israel's God. The God of Israel, the God of the universe, the one whose name is Yahweh, I am that I am, gets a hold of Cyrus. You see, friends, being a vision carrier has nothing to do with your pedigree. It has nothing to do with your past history. It has nothing to do with whether or not your mama, your daddy, your great-grandmama, your great-granddaddy were a part of the church. It has everything to do with your current openness to God. It's about you being available for God to get a hold of you. Because the truth of the matter is none of us started out under the influence of God. None of us were vision carriers from birth. None of us, as much as you may want somebody to believe that you came out the womb with a Bible in one hand and a hymnal in the other, none of us came out that way. None of us came out into this world calling on the name of Jesus. But every vision carrier's testimony is that one day God got a hold of us. And for a whole lot of us, it was on a day that we weren't even looking for God. But God intervened and intersected our path. God found us, caught us, drew us, attracted us, rescued us, saved us, delivered us. Some of us were like Moses, thinking it was just going to be another day doing our ordinary thing. And it turned out to be the one day where God confronted us in a way that we could not ignore. For others of us, it was like Isaiah. We were and even expecting the Lord to show up and that's when the Lord showed himself and showed who we were and in terms of our shortcomings and he allowed us to hear his voice calling us into active participation for him for another group we were just like Saul of Tarsus we were on an anti-Jesus fast track straight to hell and then God knocked us off of our high horse that we were riding and changed our lives Come on and tell the truth. You were going to hell on a first-class pass enjoying the ride, but God stopped you in your tracks, knocked you down from how high you were, and showed you your need for him and his son, Jesus Christ. And still for another group, there were those of us who were like Jonah. We thought that we could catch a ship headed in the opposite direction from God intention and God value and God vision and God 
God let us run right into a perfect storm that caused us to know if I'm going to get out of this, it's going to only be by God. And we found ourselves accepting the same word that God tried to give us before the storm ever came our way. But somebody, you may be Jonah. You may be Moses. You may be Isaiah right now. And what the Lord is saying is your past orientation really does not matter. What matters to him is, are you open to him now? Will you listen to him now? Will you receive him now? We aren't told the specific circumstances around Cyrus' openness to God. We just know this. In 539 B.C., he came under the influence of God. Do you remember what your year was? Do you remember what your day was? Do you remember what was going on in your life when all of a sudden you became open to God? For somebody, this is your day right now. This is your moment right now. We are not given the specifics of Cyrus's opening moment, but we are given a clue into the general. The latter part of verse 1 reads this way, fulfilling the Lord's earlier message through Jeremiah the prophet. You see, in Jeremiah 29 verse 10, God had told Israel these words, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you. And I will cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I have for you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. I will be found by you and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all of the nations and from all of the places where I have driven you. And I will bring you back to the place which I caused you to be carried away captive. God said that 70 years prior to this text. And if that is is impressive, this is going to really hit you 150 years before this text. God named Cyrus by his name as God's instrument for restoration and the rebuilding. Listen to what God says through Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth all by myself, who frustrates the signs of babblers, who drives diviners mad and makes their knowledge foolish, uh, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah, you shall be rebuilt, and I will raise up her waste places, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up the rivers, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform my pleasure. I want you to understand years, decades, and even a century before Cyrus was ever born, before Cyrus was open to God, God purposed Cyrus to be a vision carrier. Before, while he was yet in his mother's womb, God had already named him as a carrier of God's vision and a fulfiller in the restoration and rebuilding of the temple of God. God timed Cyrus's openness to God's time for God's uh, purpose of rebuilding and restoring his people. And I want somebody to understand this child of God. Your openness uh, to God uh, has been timed with God's purposes. God knows you by your name. God has spoken to himself before you were ever born about your being a vision carrier. And for somebody, God has been waiting a long time for you to step into what God God has already said 
said is true about you because he said it to himself. Lord have mercy. And that's why he has not allowed any of the missteps that any of us has made to ultimately destroy us because he has said some things about us that is yet to be true. And God says you may not deserve it to be true but I deserve it to be true because I said it to myself. In fulfillment of God's word, through Jeremiah and Isaiah, Cyrus issues this proclamation. You ought to look at somebody and say, what's God said about you? What's God spoken about you that is yet to come to pass that he is waiting for you to step into and to carry and to manifest. God, having said it 150 years prior to this man's birth, now God sees it in operation. And within the proclamation that Cyrus makes, he reveals the mindset of a vision carrier. You see, before your body can do anything, your mind has to be in the right place. You have to have the right mindset, mindset. And so, and so this, this is the first part of the mindset of, of a vision carrier. A vision carrier realizes this, who you are, where you are, and what you possess are all because of God. Mm-hmm. Look at verse 2. Cyrus writes in this proclamation. Look at how he starts it out. He starts it out with these words. The Lord God of heaven has decided to give me all the kingdoms of the world to rule as my own. Now, you've got, to, you've got to understand that at this point in time, Cyrus is the most powerful personality in all of the known world. And as he sits on the throne now in Babylon, he starts this proclamation not talking about himself. He starts this proclamation declaring that his sitting on the throne, his being king, the expanse and the extent of his rule is not because of him. It is not due to the superiority of his army. It is not due to his uh, divine birthright. It is due to a decision that was made by God. God, that God decided to make him king. God chose him to be king. God chose for him to have the rule that he currently enjoys. He didn't do it on his own. The Lord made the way for him to be who he now is, for him to be where he now is, and for him to possess what he currently has. And I don't know where it happened, but somewhere Cyrus became attuned to God's voice and attuned to God's purpose. Maybe he read Isaiah 45 verse 1 where God speaks through Isaiah saying, thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors and so that the gates will not be shut to him. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight." I will break into pieces the gates of bronze and cut down the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches in secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name and the God of Israel for Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my elect I have even called you by your name I have named you though you have not known me I am the Lord and there is no one beside me there is no God beside me I will gird you though you have not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same that there is no one 
one beside me. Look at this, if you will. With Cyrus having no knowledge of God, God chose him. God made him who he is. God gave him what he has. God overcame his obstacles to his ascension. God made the crooked places straight. God broke down the gates of bronze and iron. God opened up the double doors. A vision carrier is one who recognizes that who you are, where you are, and what you have are all because of God. You have what you have because of God. You are where you are because of God. You have become who you have become because of God. God chose you to be whom you've become before you even knew his name. God chose you to occupy the position that you now occupy. God chose to trust you with the resources that are now at your disposal. And God overcame every obstacle to your becoming and to your being. God fought the battles for you to sit where you now sit. God opened the doors of opportunity through which you've been able to walk. God gave you parents to help you go to school. God provided scholarship and financial aid. God gave you the part-time job and kept your body healthy and your mind clear so you could go to work and go to school at the same time. God gave you favor in the eyes of your teachers. God put your name on the HR person's mind. God guided your speech in the midst of the interview. God blessed your work. God inspired the idea. God gave you the business plan. God showed you the connection. God brought people your way. God gave you favor in the midst of your work group. God gave you influence in the midst of your team. It was not you. It was God and God all by himself. And right now, somebody ought to just be getting happy off of thinking about everything that God has done to make you who you are, to take you where you are, to give you what you currently possess because you know what God had to overcome. He had to overcome some stuff in you. He had to overcome some stuff in your family background. He had to overcome some stuff on your resume. He had to overcome some stuff in your mindset. He had to overcome some people who said you weren't going to be and what you weren't going to do and where you would never go and what you would never achieve and that's what makes you an enigma to some because when they look at you and where you are now things just don't add up it does not make sense when they know where you came from who you were born to what you did not have what was not at your disposal and now here you are looking good doing well driving fine it does not make any sense and you know it doesn't make sense you know you don't deserve it you know you did not do it by yourself but you're able to say if it had not been the Lord on my side if God hadn't fought the battles if God hadn't made the way if God hadn't kept my mind if God hadn't kept me healthy I would not be where I am right now but he walked with me he talked with me he told me I was his own he showed me what I saw he gave me what I needed and here I am on a Sunday morning giving him glory and giving him praise Who you are, where you are, what you possess are all because of God. That's, the, that's step one. You got to have that before you can get anything else. Who you are, where you are, what you possess are all because of God. But the second part is this. God seeks to use who you are, where you are, and what you have for his purposes. Again, verse 2 reads, The Lord, the God of heaven, has decided to give me all the kingdoms of the world to rule as my own. Lord, 
Lord have mercy. In return for this, he has told me to build him a new house in Jerusalem of Judah. <laughs> Do you see it? Uh, he's given me rule for all these kingdoms to rule, <laughs> right, as my own. Look at your name and say, as my own. In return for this, <laughs> he has told me to build him a house. Uh, those four words, in return for this, uh, don't sleep on those two words, on those words. That is God having invested place, position, power, prestige, prosperity. That God did it with a return in mind. Friends, whatever God makes you, wherever God takes you, whatever God puts at your disposal and under your influence has a return quotient. That is to say that there is a purpose attached to your place, to the power, uh, to the position, to the prosperity that you have. There is a return that the Lord has in mind. Jesus puts it this way, for everyone to whom much is given, yeah, much is required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Let me, let, me, let me let somebody understand. Uh, if the Lord invests much in you, he's not going to ask the same from you as he will ask somebody from whom less has been invested. So you can't look at the Lord saying, you know, God, I'm, you know, I'm tired of you coming back to me. Asking something else from me uh, that you ain't asking of other people. Uh, well, well, but the Lord is saying, but they haven't gotten what you've gotten. Now, the moment that you get sick of me giving you what I give you, that's when you get tired of me asking from you what I'm asking from you. But as long as you like what I'm giving to you, Understand, I'm going to be asking something from you. Oh, Lord, have mercy. If you like increase, guess what? Increase request. If you like expanding your territory, expand it ask. Because for whom much is given, much is required. And here's the question that, that God is asking uh, if you were a stock, what ROI rating would you get? Would, would God call you looking at the return on his investment? Would he call you a blue chip stock? If, 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 if one of the archangels were a heavenly stockbroker and, and the question was asked about your rate of return and how good of a kingdom investment you are, would they say buy you or sell? Based upon your kingdom return. Cyrus recognizes that God's placement and blessing has God's purpose in mind. There is a return to which the Lord is looking. And look, watch, watch, watch this now. God doesn't leave it up to Cyrus to determine what that is. God told Cyrus explicitly. Cyrus says he told me to build him a new house in Jerusalem of Judah and any of his people living in my empire may return to Jerusalem of Judah with the help 
of the Lord God. There you may rebuild the temple of the Lord, Israel's God. Watch this with my resources and my blessing. Cyrus understands that what God wants him to do with the place, the power, the prestige, and the prosperity that he has at his Disposal. That is to say, he is where he is. He's sitting where he is sitting to be able to affect the return of God's people to Judah and Jerusalem and to assist them in the rebuilding of the temple. The power that he possesses is for him to be able to set in motion their return and he is to make his resources available so, they, so that they can build what God wants them to build. Who he he is and what he has are for the purposes of God. Now, here's what that said to me. It said to me, shouting off of who God has made me, where God has taken me, what God has given to me is of no consequence if I don't use that for the purposes of God. That it would be a waste of God's investment if none or even little of what God has invested in me is used for him and his work in the world. For everybody else to get the benefit off of his investment in me and little to none of that directly impacts the work that he wants to do in the world, it will invalidate my shout and make mute my dance. Who you are, where you are, and what you you have are because of God who you know and who listens to you and who you listen to are so that God can fulfill his purposes do you think that you know who you know just to know them for yourself do you think that you sit on the boards and the commissions that you sit on just because you're a good person do you think that you have the platforms that you have right now the exposure that you have right now just to validate yourself self-esteem and make you feel good about yourself no child there is a higher purpose to all of that at the end of the day God is looking to see if any of that has a redemptive result does any of it further his work in the world does it further his desire for reconciliation and justice and equity and righteousness does anybody come into a greater awareness of who he is and his will for their lives does it lead anybody to becoming more committed to him and involved in his work and in the world beside it looking good on your resume does his resume look better is his reputation enhanced is his influence extended a vision carrier recognizes that who I am and where I am and what I have is so that I can fulfill the purposes of God in other words his placement is for his purpose his prospering me is for his purpose his giving me power is for his purpose it's not just so I can live in a nice neighborhood wear nice things, drive well, and send my kid to the college that they desire. No, that's all good and well, but at the end of the day, have I also, besides that, have I done anything that makes a direct impact upon the kingdom of God? Do you have to infer, 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 or can I point to how my life has been lived in such a way that somebody has become curious about God and has been able to ask me, how do I live the way that I live and I'm able to give them a concrete answer about Jesus being the way the truth and the life is there a direct kingdom impact that my life is making Cyrus makes himself he makes his resources available and here's what's really intriguing about this Cyrus makes his resources available to build a building he'll never visit <laughs> you know we read through scripture and sometimes we just miss about what it's saying Cyrus doesn't say you know the Lord has told me to build him a church in Babylon where I am that in what he says. He says, the Lord has told me to build him a new house 
in Jerusalem of Judah. And I'm going to make my resources and my blessing available for building a house for the Lord miles from where I live. Lord, have mercy. Uh, he, he seeds into a vision where he will never worship. His contribution is not about his individual benefit. It's not based on his children getting anything out of it. It's not about him or his. It's about the Lord. It's not about whether or not he'll be there. It's about where the Lord is going to be. It's not about what he'll be doing where he is. It's about what the Lord will be doing where the Lord is. It's about his being under the claim of the Lord. The Lord who has blessed him where he is and with what he has, he says, is worth whatever I I have wherever the Lord directs it to go. What he releases does not have to directly benefit him because he's able to give from a direct benefit. Tell your neighbor, wake up and catch that one. He says, I don't have to give to something that will directly benefit me because I realize being able to give is a direct benefit. He says, my being king is a direct benefit. The power that I have is a direct benefit. The resources that I have at my disposal, that is a direct benefit. And recognizing that enables him to give to a God vision that will not benefit him directly at all. But Cyrus will tell you the fact that I'm able to give it is a direct benefit. When you understand that who you are and where you are and what you have are due to God and are for the purposes of God, then you have no problem giving to a God vision that may not directly benefit you because you understand that you are giving out of a direct benefit. The ability to give it, Lord have mercy, is a direct benefit because you recognize you didn't always have what you have right now and the Lord has put it in your space. That, my friends, is a direct benefit benefit. You can say I will gladly make available to God because I understand that who I am and what I possess and where I am are all due to the Lord by himself. You're able to co-sign with David who sang this in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. He says you are blessed O Lord God of Israel our Father forever and ever. All that is great, all that is powerful, all that is glorious, all that is victorious, all that is majestic Majestic, it is yours, O oh Lord. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, it all belongs to you. The kingdom belongs to you, and you are the head of it all. Wealth and glory come from you, God. You rule over them all. In your hand is power, in your hand is strength, and you use them to strengthen everybody. Because of your greatness, our God, we are able to testify about your greatness and praise your glorious name but then David says but who am I and who are your people that we can offer up anything to you so willingly because all our offerings come from you and, and my God we give you nothing that isn't already yours ah oh, David says because I realize that everything is God's and so whatever I have has come from him but it's still his when I bring it back to him I'm just saying it came from you and I'm giving it back to you and I realize it's just a blessing for you to trust it in my hand when I think about the fact I don't deserve it but you put it in my space anyway when I think about the times that I have not been as faithful to it but you still entrust it to me anyway I gladly bring it back to you because I know you didn't have to trust me with it in the first place you could have taken it from me a long time time ago and therefore God I give it to you willingly because it was yours and it is yours God made you who you are God has taken you where you are God has given you what you have now I hear somebody saying well uh, there's one problem with that I'm not where I used to be. Yeah, I heard you. 
I used to have a little power, but now I don't have as much power as I had before. I hear you. Mm -hmm. Here's what the Lord says to you. Yes, that's true. You may not be where you used to be, but guess what? You still are. You talking about position, I'm talking about purpose. Lord, have mercy. And if you can ever lock in on your purpose, position will not matter. Because guess what? You don't become a baller in your mind when you get to balling status. You got to think balling before you get to that place. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You don't become real faithful when you get a lot. You become faithful when you got a little. And when I can trust you with a little, guess what? I have no problem trusting you with more. Am I talking to anybody in here? Tell your neighbor, I was big before I got to a big place. Because it was my mind, it was my heart, it was my spirit. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. What you have. Tell your neighbor, get it in your mind. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Who you are, where you are, what you have are because of God and are for God's purposes. But there's one more thing about this mindset. You are who you are. You are where you are. You have what you have. So that you might influence others for God's purposes. Now, but before I go there, because the Spirit just, is just won't let me leave that last point for a minute. Before Cyrus took over Babylon, Babylon had a king named Nebuchadnezzar. And there was a time when Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful person. And unlike Cyrus, if you read Daniel chapter 4, you will see that Nebuchadnezzar walks out on his balcony, talks about all the kingdoms that he's got, all the stuff that he's got, everything that he's made of himself. Now, he does this after having been warned about his pride. And when he goes out there, talks about, I'm balling, shot calling, got the corner office, I'm in a C-suite. That's when the Lord drove him mad. That's when the Lord took it from him, put him out in the wilderness, made him live like a wild person had feathers coming out of his body, looking like a wild animal, until he recognized that the Lord God of heaven and earth rules and that he is the one who exalts and he is the one who abases. What are you saying? I'm saying sometimes God has to bring us down a notch so that we can recognize who is in front and who is not who is Lord and who is not? Who deserves the attention and who does not? And I'm just trying to let somebody know this might be a resetting period for you to get your priorities in order, to get you in the right mindset so that the Lord can restore you, Lord have mercy. But guess what? When you're in your right mind, he'll give you more than you lost. I'm trying to high-five your neighbor. If you had that in your mind, was out of his will what will he trust in your hands when you get your mind in his will mm. yeah you know when you told the Lord to speak to your heart you might not have had that one <laughs> who I am what I have where I am, come from God, they're for God's purposes. But here's, here's the other part of the mindset. You are who you are. You are where you are. So that you might influence others for God's purposes. Cyrus, king of Persia, 
conquers Babylon, sits on the throne now of Babylon so that God might use him to release God's people to return to Judah and Jerusalem and to rebuild God's temple. God puts him where he is. He was, tell your neighbor, he was already king, but he now sits on the throne of Babylon. What's so important about that? Babylon is where God's people are held. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, tell your neighbor, he just got a new office. And his new office is now where God's people are. And God, God, God now uses him in this new position that he has to inspire God's people to rebuild God's house. Look at him exerting his influence. In verse 4, he writes, Every Jew who lives here or in any other part where of my empire... And you wish to return to Jerusalem, you will be supported by your neighbors. They should give you silver, gold, goods, cattle for your journey, and they should give you a free will offering. They should put something in your hand. They should break off a piece of change for you. Cyrus uses his place now to prompt and inspire the actions of other people. And look at the response in verse 5. Verse 5 says, The tribal leaders of Judah and Benjamin, the priests and Levites, and everybody motivated in his or her spirit by the Lord God, prepare to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the Lord's temple. It's, it's important that they had in their minds not just going back to Jerusalem, but to rebuild the Lord's temple. All their neighbors gave them silver and gold and goods and cattle and valuable things for their journey just as Cyrus had requested and sent free will offerings. Uh, they had some faith forward envelopes and put them in their hand. Even King Cyrus commanded his treasurer, Midrathoth, to return the vessels from the Lord's temple. Look at this. Having come now under the influence of the Lord, Cyrus now exerts his influence upon the lives of others. Cyrus, having caught God's vision, he now helps others catch God's vision. Having accepted the Lord's claim upon his life, he now is a vessel through which others are able to accept God's claim upon their lives. Having had God stir up something in his spirit, now Cyrus says, let me stir up something in the spirits of those who are connected to me. Because a vision carrier recognizes this, God has a desire to use you, to use your influence, to influence those who are connected to you and just like Cyrus's elevation gave him the position to influence others so has God's placement of you given you the opportunity now to influence other people those who are connected to you your family your friends your neighbors your co-workers your life group members your frat your sorority your gym rat friends your team ministry all of those have been exposed to you so that you might be able to help them catch what the Lord has given to you. God doesn't just want them to catch a fashion tip or, or catch a stock tip or to catch my God a game tip. God wants them to catch a kingdom tip. God wants to use what you've seen to help somebody else begin to see. God wants to use what you have heard to help somebody else begin to hear. God wants to use what you've released to help somebody else begin to release. God wants to use my God what you felt to help somebody else begin to feel. God wants to use Use what you understand to help somebody else now understand. Cyrus said, I'm carrying this vision, and it spreads to other people. Tell your neighbor, it spreads. 
Cyrus's giving begins to spread. Cyrus is talking about the vision begins to spread. Cyrus's support of the vision begins to spread. God wants to use your carrying of the vision to spread to other people. God wants to use your carrying of his vision to become contagious. He wants you to, he wants to use your support to be infectious. And if you have been blessed by God, you ought to thank God that part of the blessing of your life was that there have been some vision carriers who have been connected to you and you've been blessed by their carrying the vision. I don't know if you know it or not, but if you are saved today, if you raise your hand talking about I thank God for the blood of Jesus signing my name and for forgiving me of my sins, you are that today because somebody carried the vision of God and you were able to catch it from them. And somebody will say, I want to thank God for a vision carrier. I want to thank God for somebody who didn't just carry the vision, but I want to thank some God for somebody who was and is the vision. There is somebody who just didn't carry it, but he was it and he is it. John put it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth. God desired that you and I might catch the vision of who he is and how he is and what he desires for our lives and whereas he used to speak by way of prophets he says I got to do it a new way I've got to have somebody embody who I am I've got to have somebody be me in flesh and therefore he sent Jesus through the gestation track of Mary had him come through the womb of a virgin woman in a stable called Bethlehem and had him live for 30 and 3 years that there might be some that might catch the vision of God because Jesus was a vision carrier he was the image of the invisible God. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And when one of his disciples would say, show us the Father, he said, haven't you caught the vision? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And from now on, you've seen him. And now on, you know him because he was God's very vision carrier. He carried God's vision of salvation and redemption. He carried it. But high five your neighbor and say he didn't just carry it but he also fulfilled it just like Isaiah had a word about Cyrus 150 years before Cyrus's time Isaiah had some words about this vision carrier one of those words was behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and he shall be called Emmanuel that was his birth but then Isaiah said I got another part of the vision of God he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace would be upon him. And by his stripes, we'd be healed. Jesus gave his life for the vision of God. For there to be a reconciled and redeemed humanity. God kept every aspect of the vision for Jesus. He kept the vision of his birth. He kept the vision of his life. He kept the vision of his death because they hung him high and they stretched him wide. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows and the Lord called him stricken for us all. But that's not how the story ends. He died on Friday but early Sunday morning God raised Jesus from the dead. He's alive forevermore. And why is that important? It's important to know that if you keep one part of the vision, he'll keep all of the vision. And is there anybody here who can say, I thank God because he's kept one part of the vision for my life. He's blessed me in so many ways. He's taken care of me in so many different circumstances. And if he has kept a part of his vision for my life. I believe
believe he's able to keep the whole vision. That's why Paul said, I know in whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed under him against that day. Why do you say that, Paul? Paul says, I say it right here because my current circumstances don't look good. I'm not writing this outside of jail. I'm writing it in prison. I've got prison bars in front of me. I've got Nero's chopping block waiting on me. But I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed unto him against that day in good times and bad times. He'll keep every word that he said. He'll keep every part of what he's shown. And that's why Paul, at the end of his journey, can say the time of my departure is now at hand and I'm ready to be offered up. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. And now there's another part of the vision. There's another part of the promise. There's another part of the revelation that God's going to keep. And now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness uh, laid up uh, just for me uh, and for all those uh, who love his appearing. Uh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, high five your neighbor and say, neighbor, regardless of the time, regardless of the season, God uh, is keeping his word. Uh, God uh, is keeping his vision. Uh, Jesus died, uh, but he got up. Uh, and there were 12. Uh, they caught the vision uh, and it spread uh, to 120. Uh, and then on the day uh, of Pentecost, uh, when the Holy Ghost fell, uh, it spread uh, to the 3,000. Uh, and it spread uh, throughout Jerusalem. Uh, it spread uh, throughout Judea. Somebody caught it uh, in Samaria. Somebody got it uh, in Antioch of Pisidia. It spread uh, down Asia. Germana went down into northern Africa, went across in the Roma, went down to southern India, got all up in Europe, went across into Asia, got down to Latin America, hit the Caribbean, came up to North America. Tell your neighbor it spread. And it's still spreading uh, till one day uh, it got in my house, uh, caught my family, uh, got my mama, got my uncles, uh, got my pastor, made them uh, vision carriers uh, for me. Uh, and one day uh, I caught the vision uh, for myself. Uh, I got the vision of the love of God in Christ Jesus. I got the vision that if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things become brand new. I caught a vision of the purpose that he had for my life, and it was greater than what I thought of for myself. And I made up in my mind, I will be a vision carrier. Do I have a witness? Is there anybody here? I'm gonna say, I'm glad I caught a vision of salvation. I'm glad I caught the vision of forgiveness of my sin. I'm glad I caught a vision that there's more in my future than there is in my past. And God has made me a vision carrier. High five your neighbor and say, neighbor, if you want to catch the love of God, hang out with me. If you want to catch the grace of God, hang out with me. If you want to catch the mercy of God, hang out with me. If you want to catch 
the joy of the Lord. Hang out with me. If you want to catch the praise of God, hang out with me. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for raising me. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for elevating me. Thank you, Lord, for promoting me. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me. Do I have a witness? Is there anybody here who can say, all I got to do is just think about his goodness? Think about food on my table. Think about clothes on my back. Think about a roof over my head. Think about sanity in my mind. Think about peace in my soul. Think about joy in my heart. Yeah.